in there with um, uh, some uh, water particles inside. And um, you have to imagine that each of these uh, water particles is actually moving due to the Brownian motion that Patrick mentioned earlier. So uh, it is really this uh, movement that um, we try to detect in uh, diffusion MRI and we try to um, use to make tractography images. So when uh, this movement occurs, uh, we can characterize it in this type of geometry as um, a movement along the axis of the axon, and we call it uh, axial and, or parallel displacement, or perpendicular to it. And so uh, let's imagine now that we can measure this kind of uh, uh, displacements. Then once we have that, we can uh, really use them to do some other uh, some maps of the brain, uh, and one of them is uh, the well-known fractal anisotropy, where uh, with um, a bright pixel we indicate uh, a voxel with where the diffusion process occurs in a uh, along a preferential direction, and uh, we call that high anisotropy. Conversely, in the dark areas. Uh, we have low anisotropy, meaning that the diffusion process is not confined within these uh, very anisotropic structures like axons, so uh, what we find in the white matter, uh, but occurs uh, in the same way along uh, several directions. So you might ask, so where am I going with this? Uh, what about tractography? Well, uh, diffusion uh, imaging also give us some directional information. So now you will notice the same image as before. Uh, I go back this one, but now it's being color coded based on uh, the principal direction along which water particle diffuse. So a red color corresponds to a X direction, a green color to Y direction. So let's say from a nose to the back of the head and Z color, um, blue color to the Z direction. So from uh, the neck to the top of the head. And uh, what about tractography? Well, uh, this is the same kind of directional information and the same color coding, by the way, that uh, we are going to use when uh, illustrate when uh, generating uh, tractography. But um, I would like to um, go a little bit back on the intuition of what's happening uh, between inside the voxel and what is the relationship between this diffusion process and the signal we actually measure because we uh, measure a signal we will compute something to obtain this directional information so here there are again uh, um, the two uh, directions of uh, diffusion in uh, our axon and uh, we need to remember in diffusion MRI that whenever there is a small displacement, so the yellow one over there, we will have a high, uh, uh, a non attenuating uh, signal. While along the direction where we have uh, the highest diffusion, the signal will be lower. So we can say that we have a sort of a 90 degrees relationship between uh, the uh, diffusion, um, our description of diffusion, and uh, which is represented by this ellipsoid in blue, and the signal that we actually uh, measure uh, with the scanner. But uh, how do we measure this signal? So uh, now I would like to briefly mention the concept of diffusion weighting because you will find it uh, also in the metadata of the images that you are going to uh, process, for instance, with the connector mapper. So the diffusion weighting is uh, typically described by uh, something called B value. And if you notice the uh, unit of measurement is second over millimeter squared, which is the reciprocal for those of you who are familiar with it, uh, um, to the unit of measurement of what of diffusion actually, but uh, so this B value measures how strongly we want to attenuate the signal coming from diffusion particle. So again, uh, our axon, and we've seen that um, 
we have this 90 degree relationship between the geometry, let's say, and uh, the uh, diffusion signal that uh, we are measuring. So this uh, black profile over there. This is true only if we tell the machine to uh, use a diffusion weighting. Otherwise, uh, in, a, in the absence of it, we could think of the signal as uh, uh, being the same along all the spatial directions. That's why I'm pictorially reporting here a circle, a big circle. And you see also that uh, this, big, this circle is much, much bigger than, um, than actually uh, the ellipsoid you see uh, on the right. And uh, this diffusion weighting also, this B value, um, has also another effect because if we increase it much more, then uh, we will uh, kill more and more the signal. And we will be sensitive to only smaller and smaller displacements. So um, this is actually just to give you an intuition about uh, the B value, then there, there will be way more to say about this. But uh, for the sake of time, let's say that uh, when we acquire diffusion images, we need to indicate at which B value. And you will see in some cases, you will need to use more than one B value, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, what's important here is also that by using this B value, then we can have also uh, the information about the direction. And we remember this uh, perpendicular uh, relationship we just seen before. So as an example, uh, let's imagine that we are observing the brain uh, from above where the eye uh, is located into that plane. And uh, let's say that we uh, use B value equals zero. So we have a known weighted images, image. And we see on the right, on the left here, the image as um, uh, a tissue, a, a contrast that is given by those uh, who are familiar with it uh, by a T2 contrast mainly. So uh, a spin echo contrast. Um, then we can decide to measure diffusion along, let's say, this direction. And uh, this direction uh, is uh, the blue one with the B value of 1000. So the first thing we notice here is that uh, the image uh, uh, in blue is actually much dimmer compared to the non weighted one. And this, is, this should uh, uh, remind you of this killing the signal relation, uh, uh, effect of the B value that we are seeing here. Uh, and also we see some contrast that is a bit asymmetric uh, with respect to uh, what we saw in the green image. But uh, let's go on, we can uh, choose another direction and uh, still with B value 1000. And now we should be able to see that there is yet another contrast. So the secret here is that whenever the uh, acquisition direction we are uh, using, so the light blue one in this case, is aligned with the underlying axons, then as we've seen before, the, the B value is going to kill the signal. So it's gonna attenuate the signal. And that's why we see those dark areas. So whenever we have the direction uh, of uh, diffusion we are measuring with um, aligned to the underlying uh, axons, then uh, we will have a dark uh, a contrast uh, in the images. And of course, we can increase the B value much more. And then you will see again that the uh, images are also uh, darker and uh, we actually see very well the asymmetries and the type of weird contrast that are difficult to understand also uh, when just looking at these images like that. Uh, how does it work in practice? Well, in practice, uh, uh, we have the B values and the B vectors and a pictorial representation will be the one on the left. So in these two uh, text files, we have uh, two B values, uh, actually three, we have zero, which is the no weighted image, then 1000 and 2000. And uh, uh, on the right, there are the corresponding directions. So uh, also to give you the nomenclature, these are always all often referred to as shells. So we have uh, the red shells and uh, the uh, blue shells. 
Um, and some technique will use only one shell, like diffusion tensor imaging, some others uh, will require the use of multiple shells. But I want to stress again uh, a point here, just to give you the, the physical intuition. So the presence of diffusion attenuates the signal. So here I'm pointing towards the ventricles, which are basically some uh, water pools in, uh, uh, in, in the middle of the brain, uh, full of cerebrospinal uh, fluid. And um, there diffusion is very high because it's not confined inside of uh, axonal structures. We are outside the white matter. And it's isotropic because since there are no barriers around, then it will occur equally along all the directions. Indeed, if we go to look again uh, at our diffusion weighted images, it doesn't matter which direction we had chosen in order to encode uh, um, this, um, to encode diffusion, the ventricles will always appear uh, dark. So this is just, again, to give you a further uh, intuition than we can discuss more later uh, about if you have any questions. Uh, I will go very quickly uh, um, on this is just to uh, indicate that uh, there is a, a reason why I'm, I'm using these ellipsoids to indicate diffusion because uh, traditionally with diffusion tensor imaging, uh, diffusion has been um, illustrated as a Gaussian process that uh, gives us in three dimension a tensor, which pictorial representation looks like uh, the one on top right, which is the diffusion profile for some axons that you see on the left. But um, we will skip to this. We just need to remember that uh, for each voxel in the brain, we can compute such a tensor. And, uh, here we have an illustration of a tensor field uh, where uh, you see again the color codes uh, RGB and uh, you see the tensors. And this is actually the basis for doing what's called a uh, diffusion tensor deter deterministic tractography that is historically the first one that has been uh, developed. Where we just need to basically follow the uh, main direction of, uh, of uh, each tensor at its point, and uh, by doing by joining the dots, basically we can uh, perform tractography. But just to give you a, a, an algorithm how to do that, we start at the point that we call seeding point, typically in the white matter, and then we evaluate the tensor uh, in that direction, and we ask ourselves. Uh, was there low anisotropy? Well, in that case, we don't know really what direction to take, so we better stop uh, propagating uh, our tract. Otherwise, if we have high anisotropy, then in that case, we can extract the direction, the, the mean direction of diffusion, and then propagate, uh, move the point basically, so propagate the tract with a specific. Uh, time step that we can choose. And then we simply reiterate again this process over and over. And that's, uh, uh, in a nutshell, what, uh, the, what the deterministic tractography is about. And uh, probabilistic tractography and others are uh, somehow similar in principle. However, when we stick to this kind of uh, tensor representation, we have some issues because uh, first of all, here we see uh, uh, two um, bright spots that I'm pointing at in the fractional anisotropy image. And so far, uh, so good, uh, nothing, uh, nothing wrong. However, there are some regions in the brain where um, there are multiple axonal populations crossing each other. And because the diffusion tensor representation is too simplistic, then uh, we will get um, we will get uh, a tensor out of that uh, configuration that is completely isotropic. Therefore, our uh, tractography algorithm, as we've seen before, will stop uh, propagation. So uh, here there have been many years of development and um, I will just jump to the uh, conclusion 
of this uh, development where uh, tensor that uh, we see in the bottom DTI has been replaced by uh, a fiber orientation distribution function called uh, uh, FODF, which can be uh, obtained by uh, some protocols that implement what's called high angular resolution diffusion imaging. So simply uh, said, uh, use many, many diffusion direction to uh, infer the orientation and of course there are some methodologies that you might have heard of like uh, uh, spherical deconvolution and um, I will I will not go over go over this but we can chat about that of course uh, whenever you want so now through this we have solved uh, the issue of crossing fibers and now we can use these peaks uh, extracted by these uh, probabili probabilistic uh, objects in order to uh, perform our tract propagation. And uh, I want to uh, go ahead with uh, how good is tractography. So here I report two examples. I mentioned already uh, the deterministic tractography. So we basically take the fiber orientation distribution function and we uh, find the peaks and we use those in order to propagate our tracts. However, there is also probabilistic photography that uses the fact that these objects are actually probability density functions. So they sample from uh, these uh, uh, functions and they propagate many tracts according to the probability indicated uh, uh, by these functions, actually. And so here is uh, just uh, an example of. Um, mm, how good it does. Uh, so Patrick before already mentioned the validation problem. This is a simulation setup where uh, we have the ground truth cortical spinal tract on the, on the left. And we have some example of uh, DTI deterministic tractography, hardy deterministic uh, tractography. And now we should be able to tell the difference between two. One is based on the tensor. The other one is based on the FODF. And uh, hardly probabilistic, that will be uh, this case uh, on top. Below, you see some numbers to give you an idea. So, uh, the one in green, it's how much of the actual ground truth volume occupied by the fibers can we recover through tractography? And this uh, is 83%. And in red, so the other number is how much do we, um, um, how many fibers go actually out of the volume occupied by the real cortical spinal tract? And, um, and so you can see actually here already uh, what is the performance between the different strategies. And of course, there is much more uh, to say about this. However, tractography, because of uh, how it's generated, can also lead to the generation of invalid bundles. So this is same, uh, the same challenge where um, uh, basically uh, we see uh, the percentage of submissions. So this was a, a challenge organized uh, again uh, with some ground truth data. So we could know a priori what was uh, good or bad. Um, so this is, uh, these are bundles that many, many uh, algorithms actually have found and in reality, they should not exist. And uh, you can see that they look quite reasonable just by looking at them, but um, they are actually fake. So tractography is sometimes also inventing bundles. And so there are some strategies to uh, deal with that, uh, which are called tractogram filtering of optimization or false positive reduction, typically. So here we see a, a simulated phantom on, on top left. And uh, basically, there are uh, many connections, so these tubes, which could be represented by the green lines between these dots here, uh, which are the seeding regions. So we have 27 true valid bundles. However, when we go to do tractography, we typically find about 440 invalid bundles. So uh, I just want to mention that there are strategies to uh, deal with that in order to recover the uh, original um, uh, the, the original bundle so to to prune uh, the, the the connections to only find the valid ones 
And uh, Connect on Mapper is actually implementing uh, uh, a very similar uh, approach to this. So uh, be aware that you can use um, this kind of uh, factogram filtering uh, uh, options also in Connect on Mapper. And uh, more about validation. So this is actually a challenge um, that uh, I co-organized and it, it took place last week actually where uh, we can simulate the full diffusion process inside meshes that you can see here on the left. And uh, from these, you can generate the connectivity that uh, Patrick has been talking about before. So I really recommend if you're into uh, this, um, this kind of things and you want to test your pipeline, for instance, a good way to do that is actually to use this synthetic uh, phantom over here and you can uh, have a look uh, just uh, Google Disco uh, Challenge and, and you will find it out. And I'm almost uh, towards the end of the presentation. I want to mention again that uh, tractography, you can also uh, use it to, uh, so you might want to uh, separate and recognize different bundles anatomically and there are options for this. So I leave you here some references and uh, some of the tools that can be used, but there are uh, more than these indeed out. So uh, these are here, I'm just focusing on tractography, but you can do much, much more than that. And finally, uh, I would like to remind you that before doing tractography, there is a full pipeline uh, of things that need to be done. So we have the raw diffusion, raw diffusion weighted images, then we need to denoise them, then uh, remove some MRI artifacts called Gibbs ringing artifacts. Some of you might be familiar with that. Then correct for eddy current distortions, then bias field correction, then resampling, etc. And only after we can obtain and calculate this fiber orientation distribution function. So uh, luckily uh, the, uh, the connector mapper here has uh, a way to do that quite uh, smoothly and you don't need to think too much about this. Uh, uh, so if, if you want, uh, take advantage of uh, all this, uh, this power you have here. And uh, I will conclude it here actually. So I, I hope I managed to give you just uh, an intuition of where the diffusion signal, signal comes from, from uh, the microstructure really of, of the brain tissue and uh, how we obtain the, uh, we, we sample in many directions, we obtain the fiber orientation distribution function, and then we apply tractography to um, create these structural connectivity matrices, which uh, then uh, can be bridged with the functional counterparts that I think the rest of uh, the school will uh, be focusing on in particular. And if you want to read more about this, there is this night nice chapter uh, that you see reported below. Uh, and